Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Black Dog Cast, where I'm joined by renowned chef, restaurateur, and author Chris Cosentino. You might have seen Chris on TV shows like Next Iron Chef, or been to one of his restaurants in San Francisco, in Canto, Porcelino, Coxcomb, uh, Rosalie in Houston, or Jack Rabbit in, uh, in Portland. Chris is renowned as an expert and an exponent of nose-to-tail cooking. His book, Awful Good, was a 2018 James Beard nomination. And um, yeah, we, we get into it. Uh, we, we talk a lot about the world of cooking and, and being a restaurateur. We talk about sustainable eating. I guess, so the reason the reason this podcast happened is that most people probably don't realize that Chris is an avid cyclist. Back in the day, he was a pro single speed mountain biker and his speciality was, um, was riding single speed in 24 hour events which is just you know pretty crazy nowadays he's you know he's an avid gravel cyclist he runs a charity uh, event called chef cycle which which raised money for no kid goes hungry so yeah we dig into talking a lot about the world of cooking uh, we talk about chris's own uh, battles with mental health and particularly you know the reason why i wanted to get chris on is because He's one of the first sort of quite high profile people within the, the sort of chef and restaurant industry to come out publicly about his mental health challenges. You know, I think most of us don't appreciate how just how hard the restaurant industry is and, and how deep the mental health issues go. And I think for Chris standing up and talking about this, you know, he was really one of the first to sort of raise his hand and say, look, you know, I've been going through this and many other people are. We also get into talking about Chris's good friend, Anthony Boudin. And, you know, I, I, most of us are familiar with, with Anthony's story and, and he committed suicide recently. And Chris talks quite openly and emotionally about this. And I have to admit, when you know, when we got to this in the podcast, it it kind of took me off guard. I, I wasn't prepared. I don't think I really took the time to sort of empathize with Chris. And, you know, I kind of moved on a little bit quickly because I was slightly uncomfortable with that. So I guess I'm just you know making a point of that now that I guess I want to just um, recognize Chris's emotion when he's talking about, you know, his good friend's suicide. But anyway, it's a fascinating conversation. We talk about a lot of different stuff. There is some quite extreme language in here. We talk about Gordon Ramsay and, and, and there's, some, there's some swear words. So just a warning if you're uh, offended by that. But yeah, let's get to the podcast and, and meet Chris. So Chris, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. How's it going? It's going pretty good today. Yeah. Um, you're in, where are you? You're in San Francisco? I'm in San Francisco. Yes. Got it. Which, uh, which neighborhood do you live in? I used to live there. I am in the inner sunset. Uh huh. Good, good. All right. Why don't you tell us a bit about who you are? I'm sure that there'll be a lot of Americans listening to this podcast who, who may know you from your, from your TV chef days. There might be a bunch of British people that don't know you. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Um, so I, uh, yeah, oh, this is always the weird part, like where you want people to talk about yourself. Like that's awkward. Um, so yeah, I am a chef. I had, I had four restaurants. I now only have two. Um, I was on, uh, shit, a whole slew of different TV shows. So, um, yeah. most recently I won top chef masters season four. I was on the next Iron Chef season one. I had a whole series with our own Sanchez called uh, Chef vs. the City. And as of recent, I've been doing a bunch of different uh, shows like Judging Chopped or, uh, uh -huh. excuse me, not Chopped. Man, my brain's <laughs> jello. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I wrote a cookbook called Oful Good and uh, Cooking from the Heart with Guts. And uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't, and you're, I, don't, you're I don't like to talk about myself. It's weird. Well, look, we can, we can, we can talk about, you know, food and stuff like that. Your, your, um, your niche within the sort of culinary world, what you're known for is, is sort of nose to tail cooking, right? Yeah. So I was really fortunate, um, a long time ago now, it feels like forever ago. It's been almost, almost 20 plus years ago. Um, I had the opportunity to sit down with Anthony Bourdain when he wrote a cook's tour and mm -hmm. 
he had rec- I'd read the book, you know, he'd recommended to me that I, you know, make an epiphany trip and go to cook with Fergus Henderson. Mm-hmm. And, um, he helped facilitate that. And I went and cooked with Fergus. And he's from the restaurant St. John in London, right? Yes. St. Okay. John and St. John bread and wine. Um, he and, you know, Fergus and Trevor welcomed me with open arms and I'd always wanted to understand why we didn't eat those cuts of meat in the U S it was a very taboo topic. Um, and you know, since, you know, you cast your people cast my people out of the country into the Americas. And, but unfortunately we didn't bring with us that love of, uh, those cuts of meat. Wait, hang on, hang on. Hang on. I just, just let me correct you that you're, you're of, <laughs> you're of Italian origin. Am I correct? I'm my last name. Yeah, exactly. Right. Is, Okay. Okay. But, exactly. exactly. <laughs> but my last name is Cosentino. Yeah. But my mother's maiden name is Easton. We were kicked out of England for uh, religious okay. choices. Yeah. See, I, I, I was going to jump to the conclusion that you were, you were Italian American and you'd come straight from Italy and you weren't part of the. I was like, no, no, no. We, we kicked the crazy religious people out. That was us. So, um, my, my mother's family, the Eastons, landed on a Quidnic Island, which is now known as Newport, Rhode Island. Mm-hmm. And they founded a Quidnic Island. So they were. You know, unfortunately, they gave everything away for religious reasons. So, yeah. Was, but you know, that's life. <laughs> cool. <laughs> where, 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 where were we going with that? So, so I don't back, know. back to like nose to tail cooking. You yep. spend some time with with Fergus at St. John, and then and then that just sort of um, that 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 spurred you to make this your thing. No, it, it didn't spur me to make it my thing, but I think what it did was make me realize that uh, culinarily we were very uh, close-minded when it, we talked about, everybody talked about sustainability, sustainable farming, sustainable fishing, sustainable mm-hmm. meat raising, but nobody discussed sustainable eating. Yeah. And I think that was, for me, the most important thing. Sustainable eating is, if you're going to eat the radish, you eat the greens, right? If you use yeah. a leek, you not only use the whites, you use the tops. So why not, if you harvest an animal, why not use all of it? And I think that for me was the, was the bigger picture was that, you know, you have an animal, it's going to give its life to be eaten. Let's utilize all of it and do be respectful, right? Mm-hmm. These cuts of meat are delicious. Um, and the way I described it to younger cooks is let's just say, you only have black and white as a painter. I then gave you primary colors. So it expanded your repertoire, right? So as mm-hmm. a cook, you had beef and pork and lamb and ducks and chicken. But if you didn't venture inside of that animal and take out the livers, the kidneys, the hearts, the gizzards, you know, uh, the stomach for tripe and those things, all of which have the underlying flavor of the animal from which it originates from, but it may have a different texture or a different intensity. So you're basically working with new colors, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Giving new flavor profiles with the underlying flavor, which a guest can recognize. And it really was, um, as the more research I did, and for those of you who can't see, but, uh, which I know you can't, but behind me is uh, my culinary library, which is 3,000. A lot of books, yes. 3,000 books deep. Um, and as more research I did all over the world, people were eating these cuts of meat and yeah. they fell out of favor in the U S after, uh, the end of world war II due to the fact that there was rationing stamps during the war and people were forced to eat these cuts of meat because most mm-hmm. of the protein was tinned and sent, sent abroad. So re-educating the U S palate or trying to was both a positive and also a negative at the same time. Yeah. Do, do, um, uh, do these sort of, these sort of cuts of meat require, uh, more, um, more skill when you're cooking them to, to create dishes that are more flavorful and, and whatever else you have to do so that it doesn't look like a piece of tripe sitting on a plate. Right. Well, I think for me, the number one thing was if I was going to serve it, I wasn't going to hide it. Um, right. I think for me, that is a, a disservice to the guest. Um, you know, I like to 
that's when somebody does a bait and switch, right? They tell you it's one thing and it ultimately yeah. is something else. But it's really about the, the learning how to handle them, to process them, because textually they're very different. Um, they, they're a, all organ meats are a smaller cell structure. So they fall into three different categories. You have white muscle, which is tendons, tripe, uh, intestines, like sausage casings, all those things, then, uh, skin, right. Then you have filter muscles, livers, uh, kidneys, right. And then you have cardiac muscles, which are heart and veins, to give examples, right? So when you, and blood. So when you start to think about all those things and how they work, it really requires different technique, different practices to handle them and work with them better. Um, I think the biggest frustration for me work, like I love cooking with them. It does require a lot of focus. Um, it requires knowing your rancher, where your products are coming from. But the instant fear effect of the customer is driven by what the public sees on TV, right? Or what they're afraid of, what they don't understand. So as a chef, I would always put the familiar with the unfamiliar. For, exa right, okay. for example, we would do um, lamb fries with bacon and peas, thick cut, you know, not crispy bacon, but more of like a medium rare bacon, but really thick, right? So lamb fries are testicles, right? Mm -hmm. So... Um, and, you know, that we would joke around and call it balls with bacon and, you know, and peas, right? But the problem with <clears throat> the public as a whole is they're all about watching zombie movies on TV, watching people eat other people, but yet they can't fathom the idea of actually eating a piece of meat that was properly harvested, properly handled, treated with a lot of respect. Yeah. But they're okay watching zombies eat humans on TV. I or just, they're, they're okay eating, a, you know, any fast food meat products. Exactly, right? exactly. So when guests would come in and it would be like the, the zombie joke every time, <laughs> right? Like it's like, dude, get over yourself. You're like the 9,000th person who said that to me this week. <laughs> well, um, for, 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 for most of us that don't eat much in the way of organ meat or offal, what, what's the most underrated um um, sort of dish there and and equally what's the most accessible if, if people are not you know not familiar with this where should they start you think so accessible everybody has it every single year at the same time everybody is going to have it in a week mm -hmm. they're going to have giblet gravy with their turkey no one ever complains yeah right so they're they're, mm -hmm. they're already having it right and they yeah. it's it's not even thought thought about or talked about um so I would say the most underrated is heart muscle or like beef heart. On an average, a beef heart weighs anywhere between five and a half to six and a half pounds. It's a very lean muscle. There's no intermuscular fat. Um, it's high concentrations of creatine, mm -hmm. iron. Um, and for all those bodybuilders out there who are taking creatine powder, <clears throat> eat beef heart once in a while. It'll actually do you more than that creatine powder is. Um, and if the creatine powder doesn't say vegan on it, it has beef heart in it. Um, it's, it's so as, as, like as a, a steak. As a side note on creatine. So, so, um, I take creatine, but I take, I, I've read a bunch of research and there's a, a podcast called the Huberman lab. You heard of him? No, I haven't. Um, I'll, I'll put a link in the description. He's a, he's a Stanford neuroscience professor and he has this really fascinating podcast where he gets, he gets quite deep into some of the science on mental health and things like that. And, um, he was talking about creatine as a, as a cognitive enhancer. Interesting. Um, and it's been shown to sort of to aid in certain mental health um, disorders and also for, for people when they get older to sort of stave off dementia and things like that. So there you go. Yeah. I no, mean, another good reason to be eating beef hearts. I, I, beef hearts super easy. Once it's cleaned, very simply you trim it and you can marinate it and grill it like a steak or it's really great as tartare. That's what I do a lot of it with. So, um, okay. But it's accessible. You buy it from a good rancher. I think the easiest <clears> thing for people everywhere that people are really comfortable with is chicken liver, right? It yeah. comes inside your chicken. So if you buy chicken, collect all those bits, put them in the freezer until you have enough and then mm -hmm. make, you know, make like a chopped liver spread or something delicious. It's, it's, I think it's super approachable, but yeah, that's me. Cool. Well, look, let's, um, 
let's dig into some of the some of the mental health stuff that you've talked about in the past. Um, you sort of had this moment where you like came out and you were public with your mental health issues. Um, 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 I'd like to just hear a little bit about kind of what happened before that. I mean, how is this something that goes back many years? And then what kind of what made you want to suddenly speak out about it publicly? Um, so I was in the process of opening a restaurant. It was called Coxcomb, which uh, closed during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And when we were opening it, I was actually filming a documentary with uh, uh, an organization called Chef's Feed. The gentleman, uh, it was two really great folks. I'd known them for years, uh, Blake and Roxanne. We had set up cameras and it was like during the building process and all of this. And then the restaurant opens and it was very stressful, you know, r trying to open this. And, you know, I was on property every day and mm -hmm. they brought me the footage and they said, Chris, we want to show you what we did. And I watched it and I was fucking mortified. I wasn't mortified because of what they had put together. I was mortified by how I was behaving. Mm -hmm. And what I realized was that I was completely and utterly irrational and I was not focusing. I was, I was, to put it lightly, I was fucking batshit crazy. Like, totally crazy. I had no control. I was either super, super high or I had super, super lows. And they were all extremely apparent within this 45 minute documentary. And I, I had them pull it. I mean, they just spent months documenting this process and I wouldn't let them release it. Mm -hmm. And I said, I, I can't, I can't let this out. And they said, why? And I was like, because I'm ashamed of my behavior because of the way I react. And I can, mm -hmm. and that's what really showed me how bad I really was. I couldn't see it. There's that old saying, right? Uh, you can't see the forest through the trees. Mm -hmm. I couldn't see how bad I really was until I saw it like it was a TV show. And it hit me like a ton of bricks. Um, I was saying the same things over and over again, a lot of repeating myself, um, you know, a lot of going in circles, getting nothing done. But it was really um, overwhelming and really, um, I, I, I don't know, I, I just... I came to the conclusion that I needed help mm -hmm. and um, I ended up, I didn't, it wasn't like a situation where like I brokered a deal and said, all right, guys, you can't show this. But, and then finally I was like, listen, guys, I, I, I need to get some help. I need help. I can't, I can't let the, I know the world already thinks I'm crazy because of what I cook. I can't add to the fire. I can't throw gas on the fire. Yeah. And amazingly enough, Blake and Roxanne were in my corner and they just were like, whatever you want to do, we'll do. And about a week or two later, a video that, sh that both Blake and Roxanne had filmed had come out. And it was by a chef named Philip Spear. Uh, it was a very good friend of mine. And I just uh, interviewed him for my podcast because Philip's conversation that he had, that documentary that he did with Chef's Feed was the catalyst for me to talk about it. Was he talking about similar sort of issues? He talked about his addiction to Got alcohol it. and he was very open and very transparent. And I have a ton of respect for Philip as a chef, as a peer uh, as a human, I mean, he's a father, he's just a great person and he battled his demons and he was able to talk about it. And within three minutes after watching the video and sitting there and trying to process it all, I was on the phone with him talking about, Hey man, tell me how did this go? How talk to me about it? Like we went through the process 
And then I called Blake and Roxanne and I said, all right, guys, let's, let's let the cat out of the bag. Um, I got mental health issues and I can't deal. And you saw it. You saw me in, in it. And let's, let's just address it. And I mean, there were, there were things that really made me realize, you know, then I was at the farmer's market, you know, and I would hear people like giving tours to other chefs and they were like, Oh, there's Chris Cosentino. We should go say hello. And they would be like, yeah, I would wait a minute and just let me, let me make the, let me check first. Cause you don't know which Chris you're going to get. Mm-hmm. So pe- there was definitely the rumblings of it going on that I just wasn't, I wasn't awake enough to see what was going on. Right. And, um, you know, the catalyst of it all came from an injury. Um, and I had third degree alkaline burns in my stomach, which for, I mean, I'm sure you know, and your guests know that, listen, that a lot of the chemicals your brain needs to function and to modulate itself are produced by your stomach. And uh, the nerves in your stomach are what help make these things work, right? You know, there's that old saying, fight or flight. Mm-hmm. Well, um, because I had third degree alkaline burns in my stomach, because I had a hole in my stomach, my body doesn't produce those chemicals anymore. This is sort of when people talk about the gut microbiome, right? And 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 the signals that that sends to the brain, right? Yep. I mean, yeah. mine is dead. <clears throat> dead, dead as can be. So um, that's what ultimately spiraled me in the beginning and it took me many years to figure it out yeah did you um at what point did did you sort of go and seek professional help and get a diagnosis um i got the diagnosis it took me almost five years to get the final diagnosis on my stomach yeah and then after that i just started going just seeking help. You know, I, I take SSRIs. Um, mm-hmm. I'm just, I switched just recently to a new SSRI, super low dosage. I'm actually on a kid's level. They, they kept it really low mm-hmm. because I found that um, I'm ADHD. Mm-hmm. Um, and in my world, that's a superpower. It, as a chef, it gives you the opportunity to work on 20 things at once where <laughs> that's what we need to be doing. And I found that the more I took some SSRIs, it basically was like giving Superman kryptonite. It weakened yeah. his superpower. Mm-hmm. So I figured out a balance. Um, now I, I um, low dose of Prozac. Prior to that, I can't remember the name of it. I probably remember it later, but, um, I take a certain percentage of CBD twice a day and a certain a minor, minor milligrams of THC twice a day. Got it. Okay. And those, and those equalize me. Like I'm never, I never get high. I'm just, I don't, I think the easiest way to say it is, is I can walk down the, I can walk on the top of the fence and no, I'm not going to fall to the left or to the right when I mm-hmm. use when I do that, um, you know, and my doc knows and, and everybody's it's, I'm transparent as I can be with them about everything. Yeah. And it's given me the ability to not spiral or to mm-hmm. not have super lows or super highs. Yeah. Um, I, um, I have this sort of pet peeve subject that I always hang on about when I get the chance to, um, because wh- I was fortunate when I went down the route of, of seeking, um, uh, sort of pharmaceutical help for my depression. I stumbled across a, an excellent, uh, psychiatric nurse practitioner here in Ashland who has a very, um, sort of holistic approach. And so first of all, we tested out a bunch of different vitamins and things and, yep. you know, not non pharmaceutical supplements, incremental changes. Couldn't really notice much, maybe a little bit. And then this literally, this was like t- took two years. And then when they weren't working, we're like, okay, well, let's, you know, let's look at drugs and she uses this dna test which and this is the reason i always talk about it because most people have never heard of this dna test and what it does is it gives you a breakdown of how you will react to all of the different psychiatric drugs 
And with mine, what was fascinating is there was a cross against all of the SSRIs, which said that they would not work, but not only would they not work, they could have an adverse effect. And I just thought, I was like, holy shit, how many people out there are going to their, not even a mental health practitioner or a psych yeah. a psych psychiatric practitioner, they're going to a, a, a GP or a primary care physician that's just prescribing them an SSRI and it could actually make them worse. Well, um, that's, that's a really interesting thing because, you know, as a kid, I was a Ridlin kid. I was like one of the, one of the, the, mm -hmm. the beginning Ridlin kids. There's a great documentary on Netflix about that at the moment. Have you seen it? No, I haven't. I, I'll, I'll, I lived I'll, it. I don't want to watch I'll, it again. Put, I, I found it <laughs> fascinating. I'll put a link in the, in the, in the description. <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's an interesting thing when you talk about this because, you know, and also nobody really talks about the timeline of how long it's in your system and they also don't talk a lot about how it becomes ineffective after a certain point of use yeah right so for instance what i'm on now if i want to change i have to stop taking it for a month because mm -hmm. it lies in my system right and then um there's other ones that are in and out same day there's i mean there's all this stuff it's like that information i think is really hard for people to really grasp when yep. you're not, I mean, I, I, just like yourself, you do your due diligence, just like, you know, <laughs> I do due diligence, just like you do. Like I try to pay attention and, and look it up and say, okay, what the hell am I taking? What am I, what's it going to do to me? Yeah. Is this a, is this a generic? Is it a, you know, it, it's, and there's no magic answer. There really isn't. No, it's, it's, I think in most cases, it's a lot of trial and error. Um, it's a lot of just taking something, seeing a, a, does it work? B, does it have any side effects? Is it worth are the benefits worth the potential side effects? And, and that's why, you know, I think this, you have to take the DNA test with a pinch of salt. I had a, a friend of mine who's a, he's a, um, psychiatric, uh, doctor, uh, had him on the podcast and he, he, he's not a big fan of, of the DNA test that I was talking about. It, there's some science issues with it, but just as a, as a simple screening tool, I, I thought it was awesome. And I think it could potentially shortcut a lot of the experimentation that people have to go through um, because it's really hard to get it right. You know, it, the, the, the thing that's really tough, I think, is the, the fear of the unknown when you're doing that process and yeah. what can happen. And there's, there's the creation of anxiety on top of whatever issue there may be that is it's making it worse like like is this going to work is this working is it going to make me feel worse you know because then you're then you're you're spiraling yeah wondering if what you're taking is going to do what it's a they say it's going to do or it's going to say the possible side effects i mean that is a whole other let's just the whole side effect thing is just <laughs> And drugs, I feel like everything needs a commercial nowadays. And, you know, your eyes will bleed, chronic anal seepage, <laughs> your ears will ring. But you know what? <laughs> you can go outside and play with your kids safely, <laughs> wearing a diaper and having a nose plug. <laughs> right? Like, let's be honest. It's gotten, it, it's... Only only in America, okay. right? This, the, we, we, don't, we don't have those where I'm from. <laughs> it, you, but you know exactly what I'm talking about, Oh, yeah, right? yeah. No, I, I listen, I, I've... Oh. I struggle with this whole idea of um, ask your physician for brand X or I drug. I'm like, it I'm like, no, I'll, I'll, I'll go to my doctor and actually have them recommend it. Thanks. Do you, do anyway. They say that's actually become a bigger problem than people realize. People going and requesting specific drugs. Yeah. Demanding. They yeah. self-diagnose and demand. I yeah. think that is, you know, Look, I think uh, the, the, the thing that has really been interesting is when you, you find out a lot about yourself, your friends, or who are really your friends and who aren't mm -hmm. when you talk about things. Now, there was, uh, in regards to the, the film that came out, and for people who want to see it, it lives on my website. Um, I'll, Chef, I'll, put a, I'll put a link in the description. It, it's... And also there's another whole other thing um, where I discuss my, my health 
my injury to mm-hmm. my stomach. There's a whole documentary video on that as well. But I think that the thing that's really difficult was when I did this and I spoke up, it had, you really find out a lot, right? About yourself because there's a lot of self-reflection. There's, there's figuring it out, but also you really find out who your friends are and people who really give a shit. Um, it's a really, it's a fucking litmus test. Let's be honest, right? Like people vanish people. There's murmurings. I mean, when I did that video came out, like I had people from other States who were willing to come in, help at the restaurant so I could get a break. Um, you know, I had people reaching out and people showed up at the restaurant out of the blue that I hadn't talked to in years. They just literally flew in and, um, just to be there. Right. And then you have, then you have the people that you think are thick as thieves, you know, like nothing's going to break that. And then they vanish because they don't know how to deal. And, you know, I, I don't hold any grudges by it. But I think what's really important for people out there that are listening to this that may not have mental health issues, the thing is, is when somebody talks about it, it's already fucking hard, right? Let's just be honest. It's like, but how the public and you as as friends or peers react to that is pivotally important if you make a decision to walk away that can have a detrimental effect on that person yep. if you decide to not answer a text to not make a call all their you know don't vanish because it makes them question should I have never fucking said a thing? Should I have never asked for help? Because it makes them feel ostracized, feel like shit. And you may not mean that because you may not know how to deal with it. But man, when little Bobby down the street breaks his leg, you sure run over there and sign his fucking cast, don't you? You asshole. (laughs) So think about that from the bigger picture, right? It's, it's such a, it's not a visible thing to you. It's invisible. It's an invisible pain that you can't see. You can't put a face. You can't put anything to it, right? You can't put stitches to it. You can't put a cast to it. But the person that's living with what is that invisible pain yeah. can't handle the vanishing, can't handle the shunning, can't handle the snickers. And I'm not talking a Snickers bar. I'm talking the snickering, the little snippets behind the head behind Mm -hmm. the ear. They can't handle that. So be mindful of yourself and step into their shoes because you know what? I bet you they were there when you did break your leg and you needed somebody to pick you up at the doctor's office or you needed. That's a really, really big one because I can tell you I went through that and it sucked. There was definitely a vanishing in my life of Mm -hmm. people. And then there was definitely people that I would have never expected in a lifetime who showed up and, and was, would never, never stop checking. Yeah. Do you, do you look back on that now as a, as a sort of positive because those people that did step up and especially the unexpected ones, they're people that you could then have a, you know, have a deeper connection with and, and, you know, a more, a more meaningful relationship that's not so sort of servicey. Hi, how you doing? Everything's great. Blah blah blah. I think it it really it it had a lot of positive things. Um, there was a while when I didn't want to. Um, I was really mad at myself for 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 talking. Right. Um, you know, I mean, it, it, to put in perspective, I was at the lowest point when I was doing something that I'd always dreamed of doing. I.e. opening the restaurant. Opening the restaurant that I've always dreamed of opening. Yeah. My own. I owned it. My restaurant. Name on the door. 
I was part of the design process. I picked the art. I did the plate design. I did the menu. And I wasn't solo. Like I had a business partner and investors, but it was the dream. And I was so fucked up. I couldn't enjoy the moment. I never got to enjoy that moment because I was so low. I mean, there would be days, I mean, I would go into work at six in the morning and get home at two, but Mm -hmm. there would be days where I would be curled up in a ball and I didn't want to leave the house. So like, I don't think people understand how you never know. Like it's just, and then there would be the days where I would be like up at five and at the farmer's market by six and buy everything. And then at the restaurant and you know, it was like, it's like Speedy Gonzalez and then, you know, then his, his long cousin, right? The, the slow, yeah. poke, slow poke Gonzalez. I was, I, that was me. It was two different me's happening at the same time. And one day you'd get slow poke and then one day you'd get Speedy Gonzalez. And it, it's rough. It, and then I think the, the change point, once speaking, getting help, getting in a, getting a, a system going, right? Like, um, I started on meds. I started speaking to someone, which I still do. Um, I thought was really fucking weird when I started doing it. I'd done it as a kid, but it's, it was awkward. You know, it's like, it, 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 there's expectations as a chef. You're supposed to be strong. You're supposed to be able to take the hits. You're supposed to be able to lead a team. It's, I mean, ultimately, if you think about it, chefs are like, it's, it's literally like a pirate ship, right? You're, you're mm-hmm. leading a, a band of misfits to, to the golden prize of making people smile, um, giving taste memories. And it's kind of hard to say you're batshit crazy um, and own it all the way through and have a team of people working for you that are looking to you for guidance. And I think um, that made it easier at work once I kind of let that go. Um, But yeah, I think the, you know, the constant criticism of what you do as a chef definitely doesn't help when you feel that way. I mean, people love to throw stones at the restaurant industry and love to throw stones at, you know, that dish sucked or they weren't good enough or, those things take take a toll on the hospitality industry because yeah. we're doing it because we love it. And we want to make you happy. Um, but we can't make you happy if you don't tell us there's something wrong when you're there. It's so easy for you to go home and anonymously write a shitty review of a restaurant. Mm-hmm. But if you're in the restaurant and the sh- somebody can correct it and make you happy, yeah, let them do it because that's what we want to do. Nobody wants anybody to have a bad experience. And those will weigh on people like those would weigh on me huge. Like I think I took the whole ownership beyond seriously. It's like, I have responsibility of 45 employees. Then it grew and the number grew. And it was just like, man, if I make shitty food, these people are going to be unemployed. You know, I'm going to, it was an interesting learning curve. Yeah. (laughs) To say the least. <laughs> I mean, look, I, I've I've never worked in the in the restaurant industry. Um, I've I watch a lot of food TV, right? I, um, I, I've I've probably seen all of like No Reservations and and um, and those sorts of shows. I mean, just it's it's brutal from the outside when you look at it. Those of us that don't, you know that aren't experts in the restaurant industry, it looks brutal. The, the the stress and the pressure and the the sort of big personalities and the shouting and the aggression and uh, is it that's obviously obviously a fair representation of it or is it is it actually worse than that on the no, inside I I think it's actually less than that I think, okay there we go I Good. think <laughs> I think I think there's a perception versus reality right yeah unfortunately uh, there's a gentleman who's from your country Gordon fucking Ramsay who's a proper cunt <laughs> and he's <laughs> fucked it up for everybody. And in that he belittles people on national television yeah, and the, the public loves it and thinks that's what the rest of the restaurant industry is like. Yeah. It's not the case. 
Now, when I'm in the restaurant and I'm expediting, and this is when people mostly get confused, um, I'm expediting. The goal is to get the food to the guest in a timely manner, correct, right? So I'm constantly repeating to the cooks and the sous chef the order and the fire. So when I do so, I do it very matter of fact, Mm -hmm. and I'm cutting all the words out that are unnecessary. And the way I explain that to the public is when somebody's in surgery, the surgeon sticks his hand out and says, scalpel three. Yeah. Right? You clamp. And it's very short, precise. Nobody's complaining about him. But when we're in dinner service and I go, all day, I need in the window five minutes, two steak MR, five chicken. I want three pasta, one no egg, and I need three fish, no mushroom. Ready? Go. That is perceived as mean. Yeah. That's not mean. That's direct. Now, when people serve bad food, I send it, I hand it back and I say, do it over. Yep. Again, that is again perceived as being mean. But if the guests that got that food would be pissed. So I think there's definitely a different dynamic of what really happens. Mm hmm. Um, I don't throw food. I don't yell. Um, I want people to have a good time. I'm chef is a teacher. That's what we are. Like we're only as good as our weakest link. We're only as, as good as our last plate. And I think, yes, the stress level's high. It's as high as being in, in an emergency room because timelines are very short. People want to eat. They want to eat when they want to eat. They don't care for excuses. They don't care that a dishwasher didn't show up. They don't care that the product was late getting to the restaurant so it's not finished being prepped. They don't care about anything. All they care about is their experience sitting right there. Mm -hmm. And our goal is to give them a good experience, not at the expense of my team, not at the expense of our service staff, but the goal is to give them a good experience and to do so Sometimes it seems harsh and mean and it's, and it's not like I have, a, I, I feel very fortunate that I've worked with really brilliant, talented cooks and chefs, um, over the past man years. And some of them have gone on and they have their own restaurants now, um, uh, which I'm very proud of them for following their dream and doing what they're doing. And, you know, they're become very successful and, and, they were all part of that system of growth and education and they see it for what it is, which is make the guest smile, make food, right. Make it nice or make it twice. Yeah. Right. There's that. And it's like, I, I don't like being mean. I don't like raising my voice, you know, in the restaurant, I treat it like baseball, right? Three strikes, you're out. Mm-hmm. You know, do you, th- do you think that, um, since you've spoken out, there's obviously been a lot of other. I, I would. I was just did a quick bit of research before we started, just on on you know chefs that have spoken out about mental health issues, and I mean it, it's like a who's who of like Wolfgang Puck and uh, Nigella Lawson, Andrew Zimmern, and then obviously there's the tragic death of Anthony Bourdain, which impacted millions and millions of people that are not even in the restaurant industry. Um, but do you, do you see things starting to change? Um, I do. It's been changing for a while. I think, um, unfortunately in some ways I really wish that the public would recognize right now in this time coming out of COVID, the duress that they're putting on restaurants and the restaurant employees and the workers, Mm -hmm. they're treating staff like crap. They're yelling at them. They're belittling them. They're throwing things at them because they want it to be like it was. Yeah. And it can't be like it was. They're part of the reason the the spiteful, nasty animosity that they are and the vitriol that they spew on this staff uh, as guests is part of the reason why there's been a 38% exodus from the restaurant industry since they've reopened after COVID. Wow. 
nobody wants to be treated like that. Nobody should be treated like that. And, and I mean, it's a two way street, right? The, and the, the problem has to change and it. And I feel like the restaurant industry is putting a lot and the hospitality as a whole has been putting a, their best foot forward, trying to make and implement big change to make it more equitable for all parties, more approachable, less stressful, um, creating, you know, better and safer work environments, more conversations about no alcohol, more conversations about no drug use. I mean, this is really big topic things. And, but the public as a whole sees the restaurant as, a game show and they want what they want when they want it. Yeah. And I mean, you see it on the news. You, you, you're watching it on the news every day. There is, and, and you know what? It's not just the restaurant hospitality. I look at as a, as a bigger thing, right? Hospitality is on the airlines. Yeah. Hospitality is a hotel. Hospitality is a restaurant. It's a, it's a fast casual place. People are there. They're trying to make you happy and, 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 and you're yelling at them and hitting them or throwing things and s- saying disparaging comments because they aren't fast enough. Like we're coming back from probably something that no one will experience again for probably another, what, give or take 50, 60 years, unless we blow it again and create something else. And we, we, as restaurant professionals and hospitality professionals, we're trying to do the best, put our best foot forward and do the best thing. And to have, have just this animosity coming from the other side, doesn't make it any easier on the stress and the anxiety that we already have about trying to keep people employed, trying to give the best experience to a guest while maintaining safe work environment for the staff. And I think, you you said something really important there that there are a lot of people talking about mental health. There are a lot of people that have been talking about addiction. Um, all of those things, you know, um, it's a, it's a big subject, um, that will be a constant conversation for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, I don't like to talk about, some things because I feel they're really, they're really tough, but it got to a point where I finally was like, you know what, if I don't say anything, it's not going to get any better. You know, um, Tony was a very big, (sighs) Tony was a big hit for everybody. Tony's life from the outside looked like the dream. Um, yeah. it's just hard. He was a good friend. Yeah. I mean, uh, that's, that's what I mean. When, when his, when his death impacted so many people that didn't know him and, and, and I, I can't imagine what it must be like for the people that, that did know him and called him as a friend, but, um, tough times. I know exactly where I was that moment yeah exactly where what i was doing where i was my phone was i couldn't yeah it's really fucked up it's really hard it's a really hard thing to, to to talk about still so yeah moving on yeah um are there things that you've that you've sort of put in place within your within your teams and within your restaurants since since you've you've sort of spoken about this publicly just to to make it maybe a a slightly more better workplace when it comes to mental health you know we've always had hr at at all of our restaurants we've had hr availability um i've always had full health insurance available for all my staff and i'm assuming both of those things both of those things are quite unusual for a restaurant are they um Yeah. Yeah. I mean, HR is more common now. Mm -hmm. Um, but we had an HR availability, um, with a 1-800 number that you could call in, you know, um, but the, the, the more important thing was the, um, 
in my mind, was having full health insurance, eye medical, dental, yeah. um, for all our staff. That was paid for by us. It wasn't a, um, I mean, I was on the same plan as everybody else was. That's where I had my mental health services from. So mm -hmm. it was all readily there for anybody who needed help. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's not always easy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, that's it's a constant sort of frustration in this country, right? It's, it's, um, seeing how the ridiculous healthcare system works and, and basically that it shifts it all onto businesses, right? Like America's a business ultimately. Let's let business figure out everything. I, well, um, I think that's the frustrating part. And I think there's something that ties back into the earlier restaurant conversation, which I mentioned, people keep saying, well, you know, the reason it's like this is because you don't pay your staff more. Mm -hmm. And I say, okay, well, they pay their staff properly in Europe. Why is it they can do that there? I said, well, and you can't compare a restaurant industry in, in America to the restaurant industry in Europe yeah. because all, all the medical bills and all your, you know, all those things are covered in Europe. Yeah. Um, they're not covered. So like if somebody gets cut at work, that's a workman's comp bill that you have to pay. But mm -hmm. in Europe, if somebody gets cut working in the restaurant, that's covered by the, the, the governmental insurance program. So there's, yeah. there, there, there's a lot of things that you can't compare. You can't, yeah. it's different. The, the, the I, I would just, just to, to sort of counter that argument, just because in the UK, for example, yes, we have a national health service and we have free healthcare. You try to get mental health provision, on on the nhs it is extremely difficult right you if you've if you're just suffering from i, I don't know i don't want to just dismiss it by just saying like uh, you just got regular depression um you're probably not going to get access to therapy through the national health service you have to go private and pay it yourself it's there for acute issues you know if you're having an acute psychiatric issue then yes, the NHS is probably going to help you, but it's probably not going to help people like you and me get a therapist. Well, I um, think, I think, but then remember this from, from this perspective, you're not paying for the rest of your insurance, which currently has to be. Yeah. So, yeah. you mean, you're giving, you're getting something and you're being given something at the same, you know, it's, it's just a, it's a little bit of a different system where we have that. And then there's a fee on top of it. So, yeah. um, so we're basically paying double down here yeah. and you only have to pay once. So no, it's, it's, a, tough. it's tough over here. Um, it's interesting. I mean, yeah. I'm sure somebody's going to, you know, slag me for everything I'm saying right now, but you know, have at it, you know, live in my shoes for a few days. It's, you know, it's not always great to, when you get up in the morning, have a panic attack, wondering if, if things are going to go back to normal or, you know, what am I going to be when I grow up? Because, you know, I'm going to be 50 in, in next April. And like, what is the restaurant industry going to be? What am I going to do? Yeah. Um, how am I deciding the next steps when, you know, I'm, you think about like, okay, how am I going to take care of my family? How am I going to do this? How am I going to do that? And it's, you know, all I've ever done is cook. Mm -hmm. that's it. That's all I know. I've been in the kitchen since I was 14. So yeah, I can go open another restaurant, but how am I going to do that when there's, yeah, it, whatever it's, you know, I'm just bitching to the choir now. Well, um, should we talk about bike riding instead? Oh, that's more fun. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, I didn't know you used to, you used to be a pretty hardcore mountain bike racer. Yeah, I raced um, ultra endurance, twenty four hours solo on a single speed. I raced pro for about eight years. Yeah, back pro single speed, twenty six inch wheel days. I was there when the transition went to twenty nine er. Yeah, and everybody used to make fun of me when I wanted to transition. Now it's the norm. How funny is that? Listen, the bike industry's got to keep inventing new shit so we <laughs> keep buying new bikes, right? So, this... so wait a second. They took the original clunker, which had 700 C-wheels, then they put it on 26-inch wheels, and then they brought it back to the the 700 C-wheel. And now we've got gravel bikes that look suspiciously like like uh, hardtail mountain bikes with drop bars from the 90s. You mean like John Tomac used yes, to ride? Oh, John wait Tomac. A oh my what a God. legend. Wow, what a revelatory thought. Yeah. Yes, it. I like to say we ride 
nowadays on gravel bikes, you ride overly complicated trails on under-equipped bicycles, <laughs> basically yeah. like mountain biking was when we all first started. <laughs> <laughs> right. So what, is, what does cycling look like for you these days? Um, cycling is a bunch of things for me. Um, I participate every year in Chef Cycle No Kid Hungry, which is a mm-hmm. charitable organization that raises money for uh, students and kids in need in public schools. Um, so for every dollar we raise, we can feed 10 children, a whole milk, whole fruit and whole grain for breakfast. Um, that is a 300 mile, three day bicycle event that happens every year. This year will be in May up in Santa Rosa. Mm -hmm. Um, I am a partner in a cycling event called Campo Velo, which is a three day food and bike event in Napa Valley. Um, which there is two charitable components. One is Chef Cycle No Kid Hungry, and the other one is the Vine Trails, which is building a trail uh, for safe riding through the entirety of Napa Valley that would start all the way down by the ferry and take you all the way up to Calistoga. So hmm. um, so I do that, and then I decided I wanted to race again. So um, I've been doing the Grasshopper Series, which nice. is is fun i'm sure you remember the grasshopper series do you know i never did any grasshoppers when i when i lived in the bay area i was i was racing crits and doing cyclocross and and you know still hadn't got the like racing bug out of my system so Um, for those of you who don't know grasshopper started they were the original gravel event in yeah. my opinion, um, they used to show up to do that. You would have, you, when it first started, you used to take a number plate from one of your other races that you did and you would show it to Miguel, right? To <laughs> Mig, you would show him your number plate and that would be your number plate for every grasshopper. You had to keep it. So you hope to God you didn't lose it. Right. Yeah. Um, and now it's turned into like a 450 person event every shot, but it's like full and, and by the way, everybody used to do this on road bikes with the biggest tires they could get, which at that time were 25s or you yep. would ride a cross bike. Now with the, with the gravel bike and the larger clearance, it's just, but these are epic events, epic. Um, and they start in February. So it's, uh, they're it's, epic. And the talent that shows up to these things now is world class isn't oh, it oh yeah like it's off the scale like pete stanner and ted king and does levi still do them levi still does them occasionally yeah. katie courtney would come out and smoke everybody ali tetrick shows up yeah um who else have we got in that mix i mean it's just mo wilson is a new one who's crushing she's she's been winning a bunch of events mm-hmm. out of the bay area she's been doing them i mean uh amity rockwell another one uh, you've got some big, big talent. Uh, Laura King, Ted yep. King's wife, uh, she's out there. Um, you have Olivia Dill, who's another rock star on the bike. She just did Badlands in Spain. Mm-hmm. Um, so you have all that mix, right? And then, of course, occasionally Gary Fisher will show up for shits and giggles. And <laughs> uh, But it, it's, it's a pretty amazing event series, so I love doing those. Um, I always do Fish Rock, which is just insanely fun um you know i i just did the oregon trail uh gravel grinder the five-day stage race this this past june which was yeah awesome. i i looked at that and i i was i was really tempted to do it and i do it something yeah maybe it. i'll have to do it next year it looked amazing just, it, it was awesome actually i'm wearing the shirt right now <laughs> yeah. i just realized um really fun but you know I think the thing for me is, is cycling is a, and I say this a lot. Um, there's something about the solace of suffering physically that is very cleansing, right? Mm -hmm. I know that if I'm having a shit day and I get on the bike and I go for a ride, I know that there's an end to the means with the suffering. Whereas, and when I say that, I mean, I'm going to push myself, my body as hard as I can, not only to get from point A to point B, but in doing so, of course there's suffering, you're climbing, right? You're pushing yourself, you're pushing your limits. But in, in my mind, I know there's an end to that suffering, right? Yeah. That takes place of what I can't control which is the invisible suffering. Yeah. 
And it's been a huge, huge anxiety reliever, depression reliever. Um, it, it allows me to think clearly. And, you know, that's, that's been really, you know, during the pandemic, that was really a saving grace for me because I would just, I would vanish on the bike for a good six, seven hours. Yeah. You know, and I think there's finding those things are really powerful for people. Um, you know, I, I think it's not always easy for people to find something that's going to give them that Zen, but that there's something about being on the bike and, and, and you can smell the difference in the air and you can smell the wild fennel or the bay leaves, or, you know, you ride by a honeysuckle patch and you can smell the, the sweetness. It's, it's, you really just being able to take it all in. It's, it's a really powerful, but at the same time, it's letting, it's letting something go that you need to let go, but you just don't know how. Yeah. It's, um, it's interesting when you talk about it like that in a, in a, in a sort of solo context of being able to just get out on your own and, and forget what else is going on in your life. The other beauty of cycling, I was talking to somebody else about this. Um, especially when you look at, you know, some of the fundamental things that contribute to, mental health issues, things like loneliness and lack of community. I think within cycling, we're very fortunate. We have this sort of ready-made community, if if we want to engage with it, that maybe a lot of other people don't have. And, no, I, and- I agree with that. I think that's a really, you know, that's, I think that there's, I, I personally have to choose the days which that works for me, right? Yeah. And, um, you know, there's a there's a, a an old thing called the calf and back, right? Go to the cafe and back. Uh-huh. Um, basically, you just go ride your bike to go get a cup of coffee with your friends, and then ride home and tell everybody you went for a bike ride. Um, there's that, but I, I agree. Like group rides are really fun. There's that dynamic where everybody just, you know, it becomes very jovial and silly, and then everybody just tries to rip everybody's legs off, and city limits signs becomes a sprint session, and it it's fun, you know. The bike, the bike is a is not only um, a toy, but it's a tool. Yeah. And um, in two ways, right? As a kid, you look at it as a toy, but as that same child, it was a tool to get you as far away from your parents as you could, so you couldn't hear them yell your name to come home for dinner. But you knew as the sun started to set, you had to get your butt home, right? It's also as an adult. It, be- it becomes the same thing. Um, it's a tool to give you peace of mind. It's a tool to get from point A to point B, but also it's a toy. Yeah. And I think those are really, really powerful things uh, and a way to think about the bicycle. Yeah. I mean, you're, um, you're fortunate you live in a great part of the world for, for riding bikes. Yeah, it has given me um, the opportunity to ride pretty much. You can ride pretty much all year yeah. here. Um, you know, just get a raincoat and get used to it. It's never super cold. You know when it's cold when uh, you ride across the bridge and you get on the other side and there's ice in the headlands. <laughs> and that does happen, folks. It does happen in the valleys um, and it does snow in the peaks. But um, yeah, I mean, a lot of times in the winter, I'll, I'll go up north into Tahoe and I'll go... Um, I like to tele ski again. I just like to, you know, have some peace of mind and telemark skiing. Telemark skiing, yes. I love that. It's so Euro. Like I got, I, I'm a quarter, <laughs> I'm a quarter Swiss, right? My grandmother's from Switzerland, so whenever I see people like telemark skiing, I'm like, I fucking love that. That's like, <laughs> it's uh, it's definitely. It looks hard, man. I've never tried it. It looks really hard. It's, it is, and it isn't. Um, if you have cycling legs, you're basically doing lunges for six hours straight. Right. Um, but I think the thing about it is, is it's very pure and it makes everything hard. Right. Mm-hmm. So like what may have been an easy trail for you on traditional downhill skis becomes hard all over again. And it creates a sense of, um, a sense of a challenge every time you go. And I really enjoy that. It makes me focus and it makes me think. Yeah. Um, it, it helps unscatter my ADD, right? It allows me to hone everything in. And by the end of the day, I mean, ultimately I'm just doing elevation training, right? Um, 
up at high altitude doing lunges for six hours. So <laughs> by the end of the day, my legs are jello um, and it feels good, you know? Yeah. What, um, do you have any other sort of things that form part of like daily lifestyle habits when it comes to, you know, diet, supplements, vitamins, um, meditation, that, that sort of thing? You know, that's actually, um, really interesting because during the pandemic, I was having, uh, there would be moments when I would spiral pretty bad. And, um, I'm sure, you know, Jack, who Jack Thompson is Jack, the ultra cyclist. He, yes. Yeah. So Jack and I became friends prior to the pandemic and would communicate regularly. Um, and out of the blue one day he had said something like uh, I was, I don't know, probably acting pretty squirrely on social media and he just checked in with me and, and he had mentioned something about a small daily goals. And I was like, well, what do you mean? He's like, start, start your day with micro goals. Don't overset your goal standard because you won't be able to accomplish them. And then it'll set you on another spiral. Yeah. So I started with that and I said, well, give me an example. What do you mean? And he's like, when you get up, dude, don't be a bum, make your bed. There's one goal complete. And I was like, okay, that makes sense. So that was a really huge tool that Jack gave me, which I would have never, never even thought about such a simple thing, make bed. Right. Mm -hmm. And then create yourself a system. So like make your bed, make your son's lunch, make breakfast, you know, you know, for lunch for school, then breakfast, make your coffee. So set yourself micro goals and getting them done in reasonable amounts of time. And you'll find that things will become easier. And, yep. it, and it, and it did, it gave me micro things to focus on instead of having this gigantic, list of what I felt like I had to get done in the day, which as you well know, when you write those lists, it becomes unattainable. Yeah. So that, that, that I think has been the biggest thing. Um, you know, most of the time vitamin wise and things, I don't take a lot of pills. Like I said earlier, I do, um, 25 milligrams of CBD in the morning, 25 milligrams midday, three milligrams of THC in the morning, three milligrams of THC in the afternoon. Um, and you know, I take oregano oil to make sure my stomach's pretty good and I keep it simple. Yeah. I don't take Advil. I don't take Aleve. I don't take aspirin. I don't do any of that stuff. I, um, I stopped drinking three years ago. That was another choice I made. Wow. Okay. That's, um, that's a big one. I, <laughs> I, I just, I went back home for three weeks last month. <laughs> that was brutal. How was that? You know, pub life over there. Well, it's, it's, it's just really difficult to socialize with people without drinking. And, and, you know, for health reasons, I, I, I sort of think, yeah, that'd be nice to give up drinking, but it's, it's just so hard. You know, I think we're seeing more and more now non-alcoholic beers that don't, that taste good. Let's don't be, suck. that yeah. don't <laughs> suck because this yeah. stuff out there has been crap for years. Yeah. And for me, ultimately what I miss most about the, the, the alcoholic beverages, the flavor profiles, right? Like I miss mm -hmm. Negronis. I miss the bitter, the bitterness. Like I love that, that the juniper from the gin and the Campari and the bitterness, right? Um, I miss beer. I miss really great flavors of beer. I miss, like I, I miss champagne and I miss Gruner. I could drink sparkling Gruner till the cows come home. Um, so how do I address those things is I try to find alternate solutions. We can only go out publicly and drink sparkling water, so much sparkling water without exploding, right? Yeah. Without either burping or having to go to the, take a leak every five minutes, it gets old. So I think what, what I see a change in the hospitality industry, what I try to do is that all my restaurants now move, you know, over the past year is making sure that we have great non-alcoholic cocktails that yep. aren't, that aren't sugar bombs mm -hmm. that are well thought out as well as a high quality non-alcoholic beer so that nobody felt feels put out when they, when they go uh, out and they don't feel uncomfortable. Um, I want people just to, to enjoy the flavor profiles. And now I think with the, like those different um, non-alcoholic spirits that have the right 
palate feel. It feels like there's fat on your palate. And, yeah, and, like um, Seedlip. Have you tried their, their stuff? I have. I have. Yeah. There's, there's a bunch of product out there that's doing a good thing. And I think it's, it's making people feel comfortable when it can also be an uncomfortable situation having to say to somebody, I choose not to drink. Yeah. Right. And as, and I know, cause I've spent enough time in the pubs in England, it's really not like, what's your NA on draft? And they're just like <laughs> <laughs> water. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, things that things are starting to change over there. And I, and I think you see it with, um, with things like, um, you know, plant-based diets. Yeah. A few years ago, you'd never have, have, have thought about that catching on in in um, in England. It's more of a sort of West Coast California thing, and it and it has. And you, you're seeing uh, seeing a lot of coverage in the media, a lot of product being advertised. Um, it, things things you know might go the same way with um, with people drinking less. I don't know. <laughs> Wishful thinking. You know, I just, it's just a, it's just an, it's a choice, right? I think if someone chooses to drink alcohol, that's fine. I think it's just some people it does not do well with. And what I, I made the conscious decision three years ago when I realized, and I was taking my meds properly, that alcohol and my meds weren't friends. Yeah. Um, you take your meds to not be crazy. When you drink alcohol with your meds, it makes you super fucking crazy. So... <laughs> Um, I mean, I might as well have put a cape on, right? I was so <laughs> out of my mind. So once I stopped, I mean, it was literally just a cold, just a hard stop. One day I just said, you know what? I'm going to stop now. Yeah. You know, and, um, and just to be clear in regards to the CBD and the THC, my doctor knows my doctor is well aware and a participant in the conversation when I talk about this. Yeah. Uh, it's not a situation where like I'm self-medicating because I think it's cool. I do it per the conversations that I've had with my doctor. You know, there's even currently, and as I'm sure you know, there's these conversations out in the world right now about ketamine treatment and microdosing mushroom or yep. psil psilocybin treatments, right? Those are conversations that I think for some people are worth having, right? There's if it resets you and makes things balance better, that may be an option. And I, I yeah. just right now there's the brain is such a, it's such a powerful thing. We don't know all of what it can do and what it can't do. So, um, I think, you know, if you have the right guidance and the right doctor and the right things happening, then, yeah the 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 psilocybin thing in particular is is something i'm fascinated by and and especially because oregon passed this this bill um i think it was last year to um they didn't legalize it like straight off the bat they 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 legalized investigating how to use it in a therapeutic setting so yeah. it's sort of oregon's on the path to be probably like the first state where you can you will eventually be able to go and do a legal you know, psilocybin therapy session. Wasn't that um, what it was originally for the, when the government was testing it and then they decided it was bad. Yeah. Yeah. What goes around comes around. <laughs> it's exactly. Right. Um, cool. Well, look, let's, let's wrap this up. Have you got anything like what's coming up in your world, any sort of projects or events or restaurants that you want to give a shout out to? So Acacia house up in a Leela hotel in St. Helena, we are, We've been open since March and we're mm -hmm. having a lot of fun up there. And uh, about a month and a half ago, we reopened Rosalie in Houston in the C. Baldwin mm -hmm. Hotel. And that's named after my great grandmother. It's an Italian American spot, super fun. Um, and you know what? I have my podcast, which I've been doing, which is called Losing Your Mind with Chris Cosentino. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's a mix. You know, you'll get everything from, you know, I've had Tommy Guerrero brilliant musician, former Bones, original Bones Brigade member to Lemony Snicket to Chris Burkhart to professional cyclist Lauren Hall on there. So it, yeah. it in, and then the, the other day I had, uh, uh, James Shibo, who's a brilliant, you know, chef from Comey in Oakland, um, to Ed Lee from Louisville, Kentucky. And it's ultimately just the conversation is about why and how they got to where they are in their career today. Yeah. And how it took a lot of foundational work to get there. It doesn't happen overnight. 
there's no magic pill that's going to make you be a brilliant chef. And there's no, there's no magic drink that's going to allow you to do a, a double, double backy off a 45 foot cliff on skis, right? Like it just doesn't happen overnight. So, so yeah, I'm doing that and hope working on another cookbook and, uh, try to ride my bike a lot. Cool, man. All right. Well, listen, thanks for coming on. Um, it's been great chatting and, and I think it's, um, you know, this whole thing is just to get people talking more about, um, the subject of mental health and especially to have people sharing their stories. I think it's, it's incredibly valuable and, um, and yeah, thanks. No, thank you for having me and, and, uh, happy to, happy to talk about it. I think it's an important subject that, that people need to, uh, feel a little more comfortable with. So. Exactly. All right. Thanks, Chris. Nope. Thank you. Bye. Bye.